I would like to uh, begin just a small uh, introduction uh, to higher dimension. Now, so this thing is going to be called X, so X should be a circle. And one of the first uh, associated things that is important is the canonical bundle. So K sub X, if it's clear, I would drop the X, should be the canonical bundle, of, canonical line bundle of X. that mean? So the good thing about it is it's just a line bundle, not just a vector bundle. So what you do, you start with a holomorphic tangent bundle uh, of x. So we will write this Cx. Make sure you understand what I'm talking about. I, that means locally a section in this bundle is a vector holomorphic vector field. So I, uh, a section would be locally a holomorphic vector field. So it's a surface, so it's two-dimensional. So it will look like A alpha dz alpha dz alpha plus B alpha dw alpha with coordinates z alpha and w alpha locally on your alpha on your alpha, and of course, with the coefficients being homomorphic. <clears throat> so if you like, it's sheath, but it's obviously locally free because you have these coordinates. There. So where does d by d z bar disappear? That's, that, thank you for the question. This word homomorphic means they are of this type 1, 0. So, if you would talk about the full tangent bundle, you would have exactly what you want. You would have dz, dz bar, dw, dw bars. But I'm, I'm intentionally here without the bars, so this, this means only of this type. These are holomorphic tangent vectors of type 1, 0. Okay. And that's the notation. So maybe the notation is a bit misleading because uh, it looks like the full tangent bundle is the real tangent bundle, right? That's what you're thinking, and I understand that. But I mean, really, the okay. and, and fortunately, the notation um, for the cotangent holomorphic cotangent bundle is a very clearly mark one zero. So this is the same type of thing. If you have a, a cotangent vector omega locally, this means it's uh, again some couple of f alpha z alpha plus g alpha. W alpha. And here it's clear this is the type. So you see this it just has dz and dw and no dz bar and no dz w bar, and that's indicated here. Okay? So those are the basic vector bundles in the homomorphic category. 
And of course, you they're complicated. So there are vector bundles. Rank two vector bundles is, is complicated. We go to the simplest thing we go to is the top wedge product of this whole model thing, cotangent bundle. And that's a canonical bundle. So if you have a rank two vector bundle, or equivalently a rank two vector space, the top wedge product is one dimensional. And here, just to emphasize this, an element here, say an alpha, well, no, no, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, I don't know, mu. So a local section, say mu alpha, will be of the form h alpha and dz alpha, and d delta alpha. Again, with h alpha will morph. So you see it's of type 2, 0 of these things. And many of us in, think about this thing as a whole market volume form. It's not a volume form because it only has two. I mean, it would have to have four to be a volume form because this is a four manifold, right? But so I, I, I think quite often holomorphic uh, volume form. The reason I think that if you have a holomorphic change of a coordinates, of course, uh, <coughs> holomorphic change of coordinates, then uh, say gij, or g alpha beta, let's say, to match up here, then h alpha equals determinant g alpha beta. So this is, these are the transition functions h beta. So it's, it's, we often call this the determinant bundle of the cotangent bundle because, of course, the top, the top thing it transforms like the determinant. So it's, it's like a volume form which transforms as a determinant. Okay, so this is the, the first thing we look at. <clears throat> and uh, uh, what do I want to say about that? Uh, the classification of surfaces, a very rough classification of surfaces, Uh, is partitioned by uh, invariance related to the canonical bundle. Goes by invariance of the canonical bundle. So I think even one invariant, a, a particular invariant of the canonical bundle. start with a surface. We have these vector bundles that are very complicated. You should try to get at least at first knowledge from your line bundle theory because it's much simpler. Very simply because the structure group is abelian. Easier to understand. And so you go to the canonical bundle. <clears throat> now, you need a little background on this. Uh, not much, but just a little bit. <clears throat> if you have any one of these bundles, uh, any any line bundle, any homomorphic line bundle, any L, then you learn very quickly. It's even a physics thing of some sort of asymptotic asymptotic dequantization in some sense uh, to go to higher and higher powers. It's quite often an application. Uh, Particularly in terms of representation theory, it's very often the case that one line bundle or its sections will represent, represent say, one particle, one quantum mechanical particle, and then you, then you have another particle uh, here, so you would have two, and so on. And uh, if you give this to infinity, you, you somehow have many, many particles, and you start dequantizing because the particles may interact, and you may have all sorts of things. So this is even really quite quite interesting in physical point of view, is some limiting thing. And so what we do here is we have, as you saw this morning, you have you have well you have the trivial bundle because that's the zero power. You have the first power k. You have k squared. And you have all these things. Okay, these are all possible powers of the canonical bundle. You have something in here. You're looking at, at very simple-minded 
uh, tensors in this form. Uh, excuse me. W alpha with some coefficient. And then with well, okay, some coefficient. And here you will be looking at, at tensors. You, you can think of them as this power. So quadratic differentials of the top degree, whole market degree, and so on. Okay. This is what you get. And so what you want to look at here is what is called a canonical ring. Two of any bottom of it, in particular the canonical ring, which is the direct sum of all of these things. So everything you can get generated from the canonical, but it's very it's canonical. It's a ring that is associated to the manifold. Given a manifold, you have a ring. Not so bad. It's really it's trivially defined. You take you take the cotangent bundle, you wedge it up to the top power, you take all the sections you can get. That's a ring. Let me add a remark here to give you a feeling for the importance of this ring. <coughs> For many, many years, for centuries, I would say, people try to prove this is finitely generated. Yeah? And it is, and it was just proved very recently. So, I mean, like last year or two years ago. And I'm not sure whether the proof has really been checked. So, this is a this is very, very interesting question whether or not certain rings, and this one example is finitely generated. Not well, that's, that's uh, sort of a beautiful modern consideration. But once you have, so what do you have? You have x. Once you have x, you have the canonical bundle of x. Once you have the canonical bundle of x, you have the canonical ring of x, which is this thing. And once you have this, you have the quotient field of the canonical ring. Now, if you have a, a, this thing is of course gradish, and it does not make any sense at all to take the quotient of something in level n with the quotient of something in level m, because it's a graded ring, you see it. So this is a graded quotient field of this thing. sections, uh, omega 1 and omega 2, two sections, the, the whole omega 2 forms, in K. So you're looking at, well, K, okay, sections, really sections, globally defined forms. So you say, okay, I'm going to look at quotient. That's a meromorphic function because it's a quotient of two sections of the same bundle. Okay, you might do the same thing for K squared, and you get a, a more meromorphic function. So you do this for each uh, level of the gradation, take a quotient field, and you build the smallest uh, smallest uh, field that contains that. Okay, so maybe I'll call that x. So it's a canonically associated function field to the manifold. So I mean, uh, it's a subfield of the field of That's right. That's right. That is, is really, let, 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 let me just what Kevin was saying. Let's let's just really emphasize that. That is a subfield of the of, of maybe we use this notation C of X. Okay, that's the notation we use here, the full field of normal. Okay. Yeah, okay. It's a very uh, reasonable thing to look at. And we're looking, <laughs> you see it's a long story, from X to the canonical to the canonical ring, the field, and so on. And when you have a field. The first numerical invariant, so let's say we start with x, we do all this stuff. The first thing you do here is go to the transcendence degree uh, over the complex numbers of this field. So in other words, how many transcendental, uh, how many really new functions are you getting here out of this canonical thing? <coughs> Well, 
That's a very good idea. Go from x to transitive degree of the heel. This is a numerical invariant of, of x. This is a number. All right? We know. Okay. So very early in the game, people were interested in this number. And the first theorem about this number, um, which it maybe was proved by a German mathematician by the name of Tim, it's a very difficult proof, certainly he tried to prove it before the war. Ziegel gave, uh, uh, Carl Ludwig Ziegel gave a correct proof, uh, as did uh, Reinhold Remmer. These, these are in the mid 1950s, roughly speaking. Yes. <clears throat> First of all, this trans, this trans, this degree of this thing over the complex numbers is less than or equal to the dimension of the manifold. So it's a finite number. <laughs> it's a good number. You can't add on more. You believe it. I mean, you can't add any more than dimension. And second of all, in all cases. This is an algebraic uh, function field. So it's an algebraic function field means you add on <coughs> uh, finitely many of these things, independent meromorphic functions, k, and you have you, you will have an extension here, which is of an al some algebraic extension of some of some finite degree. So that's the structure of the field. It's very simple. You add on find the many transcendental elements, and then you get this extension. We already know this for, for Riemann surfaces. We, we know this thing for Riemann surfaces, although for Riemann surfaces it's automatic that k is equal to the dimension. I mean, you really have a transcendental element. Well, then, as soon as you get start talking about this theory, you have a warning. Uh, is that there are many uh, services with <coughs> no meromorphic constants other than the constants. So that means this thing is really a stupid invariant in such case. Okay. Let me just say this, if you if you look at any two-dimensional torus, which is C2 modulo lattice of rank 4, and this somehow in general numerical position with respect to, say, number theory, uh, this would be X. Then, uh, I can make it precise, but uh, it just takes a, a time to think about how the numbers here are, are, need to be lined up. Yeah. Not lined up. But then, in fact, we don't have any. I will give you some other examples later on. So the, the, the fact of the matter is that this may or may not be a good invariant. Okay. Uh, in the business, uh, the transcendence degree, the word gets pretty long, so we let A of X be this transcendence degree of this field, uh, QX, and it's called the algebraic dimension of the field. algebraic dimension of that. Okay. Needless to say, if X is a subvariety of projective space, you can build meromorphic functions all over the place by just restricting them from projective space. So if you see that uh, X projective, so a subvariety of projective space, but then of course the algebraic dimension is as big as it can be. It's the same as no. it. Why, why aren't there any, any meromorphic functions on the torus? Meromorphic function on the torus, you go to Cn, or C2 in this case, and there are periodic functions on C2. And that means periodic with respect to four, um, four vectors. This has four generators. You can take the generators uh, in, to be 1, 0, uh, 0, 1, and then some other stuff here. So A1, A2, uh, B1, B2. B, these might generate. So this is the first generator, second generator, as column vectors, third generator, and so on. Then you start writing down here what it means to, to you try to write this thing as a ratio of functions somehow or another. 
uh, and some these things should be as periodic as possible. And what happens is, is irrationality in this thing it will destroy the Fourier series type analysis that you make here. Okay, it's, it's highly irrational behavior here between these things. Yeah. Okay. If you want, I can give you a but this is this is. This is a fundamental subject, of course, and uh, if you're interested in it, then uh, there's a very good book written by Conforto, which uh, has been translated to English. Uh, maybe I don't know who wrote it, but anyway, the whole, it's a whole four-year series type of argument. Okay. So it's just simply the. And so you see, it's, it's some sort of relationship between these vectors. And in dimension one, you only have one vector. So now you only have one number. You don't have to worry about relationships. Right? In dimension one, you have, uh, as we know, one and tau. One being here and tau being an upper half plane. And uh, there's only one number going around here. Here, there are, there are all these numbers. And bad behavior in these numbers means you can't have any function. There are no bare ones. I will amuse you even a little bit more later on. Uh, uh, these things are a little bit boring, but I will give you some examples you might be amused by where there are no. Okay, so that's that's a little bit about the introduction to the canonical ring, and then. Uh, Some invariant associated with the canonical ring, which is called, which is called the algebraic dimension. Which is the transcendence degree of that field. Now, that's almost the main, main invariant that I want to introduce. The main invariant I want to introduce um, is very closely related to this algebraic dimension of X. Oh, no, I, 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 this is terribly, this is terribly, I made, I made some, forgot. This is the algebraic dimension with respect to the canonical bundle. You see, uh, you see, uh, everything I do here, I, let, let, let's review this. If I start with some, some any line bundle, then I can do the same thing. I just did it here, I'll square and so on. I look at the ring generated by the line bundle. I look at the quotient field generated by that. And then you would have the algebraic dimension with respect to that line bundle. Okay. This is, now, now you will get into this business, of, it's all Japanese. So, that may be called the Iataka dimension of the line bundle. And for the canonical bundle, this is essentially the main invariant, which is called the Kodaira dimension. So the main invariant at first is the Kodaira dimension. surfaces. The, the, the first value is minus infinity. Now minus, you see how, how we get this thing anyway. We, we have this ring and then, then we make a quotient for you and then maybe you get absolutely nothing in this ring. Absolutely nothing. It's possible. There's absolutely nothing in the ring. So minus infinity means you get absolutely nothing all n uh, bigger than or equal to uh, 1. You get nothing. There's nothing around. There are no homomorphic forms at all. Okay? 
And you know in dimension one example, that is P1, there are no holomorphic forms on P1. This is something like, uh, looks very close to something like projective space or something like this. Okay, so the next thing is Kodaro dimension zero, which by the way is very interesting. Means that the transcendence degree is zero, but it means for some, uh, some n, the dimension, there is exactly one of these things, but the transcendence degree of this thing, uh, the transcendence of uh, this algebraic dimension is, with respect to this bundle, is zero. That means, that means you may occasionally have, I'm sorry, I forgot to write it, one. You may occasionally have a one holomorphic two form. For n equal, by the way, uh, one or two or something like this. That's an interesting case, one or two. But you will never have two where you can make a quotient. You may have one. Is that clear what I'm saying? You, but you'll never have two where you can make a quotient, and then you'll get transcendence of degree one. Okay? That's Kodaro dimension uh, zero. Kodaro dimension uh, one is really the same as algebraic dimension one with respect to the canonical bundle. It's all algebraic dimension uh, with respect to the canonical bundle one and Kodaro dimension two uh, means oh let me let me just write a table here. Kodaro dimension two means uh, algebraic dimension with respect to Omega 2, you have the divisor of omega 2, 
and really divisors and sections are the same thing. Yeah. So what we're dealing with here, except for multiplicity, this is where omega 1 is 0. And except for multiplicity, this is where omega 2 is equal to 0. I'm being very rough now, but I think it's OK. OK, that's really now we're going to have some fun because where omega 1 is 0, uh, this is the point 0, 1. So, uh, so here is some curve, which is a divisor graph with multiplicity. This is where omega 1 is equal to 0. And if you, this is P1, then this is the point um, 0, 1. And this might be where omega 2 is equal to 0. And with multiplicity and so on, all sorts of stuff. And this is this point. So what it's saying is, you have two things here, and you're building this meromorphic function somehow or another. But it means is that the divisor here can be moved in a family, I mean a highly non-trivial family with singularities and so on. But it can be moved, you can avoid as we know the singularity you want, from here to there. Okay? So it means these two, geometrically at least, these two things, it's a meromorphic function, but really what it means is they have, uh, it's a, what we call a linear system, and it's a linear system from moving this thing to here, and then all, the, all what you're talking about here is all possible linear systems, from moving one to the other. I mean, that's, that probably doesn't help, but that gives a, at least one really nice interpretation of what these sections mean. It means you're going to move linear, move things to each other. By the way, in the Riemann Roth theorems this morning, L was there because it's the dimension of the linear system. Okay, I don't know. It doesn't answer your question too much, does it? So you say I have uh, a common zero somewhere. I mean, they would not. Yeah, they would a common zero somewhere, and of course, there's a problem. So as we know, if you have a common zero, you have to blow that point up. Okay, so okay. that's a problem. So what you've really gone to here, there will be common zeros. And so what, you, what you've gone through to get the system somehow or another is you have to really understand you have to separate that by blowing up. Okay. And then you really get it. It's, it's, it's non trivial. Okay. So his, his, his question, I think, is yeah, okay, yeah, there's two things. You take the question of meromorphic function, so what? Well, so the coefficients of omega 1 and omega 2, aren't they homomorphic functions? Yes. So you get meromorphic functions just after you're taking the coefficients. You don't That's right. Before. That, huh? you, I mean, you don't have any poles before. There's, there are no poles. They're globally defined, omega 1 and omega 2. Absolutely. So these things are globally defined. This, and this quotient is globally defined. And this is a globally defined meromorphic function. With yeah, poles, of course. You change it from, from C, it's not, a, it's not something that goes to C, it goes to P1. No, it goes to P1. Hmm. And uh, just what Kayvon was just saying, it's very possible here this is, that omega 1 equals 0 looks like this, and omega uh, 2 equals 0 intersects in 17 points, <laughs> and then you have these points of indeterminacy on in this quotient. And then you, it's, um, they get blown up by all of this. And so you have to really start watching out in this theory. I mean, OK? okay. Well, the quotient could be very strong. I mean, it doesn't necessarily be very nice to close to this point. Say it again. I mean, the co if you look at the quotient and sort of uh, get close to these points, it's not necessary. I mean, they're not like removable or anything. I mean, there is no limit necessary. Well, of course, they, they could somehow, what, what could happen? As you, you might guess, you might have, here might be omega 1 equals 0, okay? And, and here might be uh, omega 2 equals 0. And these things, uh, if they have the same multiplicity, will cancel. Right. You might luck out. <laughs> but, and in fact, that, that's usually the thing. You usually have isolated base points to deal with, and then, then somehow, uh, in this family, as you move somehow, that's twisting things right at the base point. I mean, so how if there's really a base point, as you move, you see, you see, as you move from one to the other, it's like this. 
<laughs> and it's really true. I mean, this is the line compactified, and therefore we say it's a linear family. Right? <laughs> yeah. A linear system. That's the geometry a little bit, but I, you, know, you, you just take the bundle, and this is for, true for any bundle. I should have been better didactically. You take any bundle, and you have you have all these powers, everything you can get from it. Yeah. The the last thing there. So the I believe the. Are you down below? No, no, it's okay. The Q of S Q of X is isomorphically embedded in the number of functions, no? Hmm. Because so since the ring is in Q of X. Yes. Is it's. Like a subgroup at least. The, the, the subgroup, uh, an additive subgroup is a subgroup of the additive subgroup of the field. Uh, but, I mean, it's. What I was trying to say is that. So, R of x is a. Is a the ring. It's, it has forms in it. And the last thing has very morphic functions. So, how can the forms. Can maybe, be, maybe it's a question what my. my just what I wrote. Is that is a morphically embedded in CX? Okay, that's okay, what wait. I mean. Let's just take this. Hmm. Yeah? Yeah? That's what's going on here, right? Yeah. Yeah? Now, what, say it again. I mean, the first thing, the ring, is, has forms in it, and the last thing has functions in it. How can forms be included in functions? That's my question. Uh, oh. <laughs> somewhere you, you, you identify something, or you embed something somewhere. Just stop. No, you're absolutely right. Stop. I, I, I can make precise what I mean by that, but, okay. This ring, you're absolutely right, this ring does not exist as functions on the, on the X. Mm. Right? That's a stupid remark. Okay. This ring exists actually, I mean, I make these translations all the time, I'm terribly sorry. If you think of it carefully, this ring exists as functions on the bundle space, actually. And so you have the fiber bundle, which has fiber C, and the sections are the, are the functions which are linear on the fiber. The sections of the second power are the functions which are quadratic on the fiber, etc. So really, this whole thing that I wrote here uh, is really, if you want to consider them as functions, it's on the bundle space. And, and, and I think that, it, I don't want to do that now. So you caught me uh, really making something. Just do this, okay? Very good, thank you. Um, I have a one question. So you said that the final generation of this ring is not, I mean, it was recently. Yes, yeah, but very not true. But for every count, right? So this no, ring. this ring. But what doesn't it follow from what you said? I mean, you wrote that few objects are generated by a finite domain. There's a ring. Oh, the ring, oh, the field. The ring. Okay, the ring. The ring is a okay. much, much finer yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. Okay. The fun I, 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 wrote, I tried to emphasize it, probably did. The ring itself is a right. much finer invariant. Right. right? The field is, is a very rough invariant in some sense. And particularly its transcendence degree is <laughs> just a number. Okay, so again. Uh, well, this is a great discussion. You have all of these very non-trivial objects going around. Yeah? Uh, like, uh, the, do you have any bound on the number of the generator? Uh, <laughs> of importance, does it have anything to do with the transcendental degree? Anything to do with what? Transcend transcendence degree. No, but you will have bounds on the generators having to do with a lot of other invariants of the manifold. Okay? No, the interesting case is probably when the when the trans the interesting case is when the transcendence degree is too. I mean, you just really that's the case you're worried about for surfaces, for example. Okay. 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 Uh, are there other questions? I <laughs> guess my didactics was a little too rough. Okay. So let me tell. Uh, Again, where are we? Here. You have four possibilities in this very rough classification. <clears throat> the so-called Kodaira dimension. I should carefully state the history of this matter. Uh, in the case of algebraic surfaces, I think everything was known to the Italians at the turn of the 19th and the 20th century. Everything was known, but 
what I'm going to say, but not proved with any kind of uh, rigor. Uh, in the, between the wars, Zariski invented the appropriate commutative algebra to handle the algebraic case. I, I'm not sure how many people really understood him. So, nevertheless, the Italian classification for algebraic surfaces uh, earlier, which is perhaps not proved in detail, is due to Enrique's. And in the case of algebraic surfaces, it's precisely uh, uh, proved by, by uh, Zemisky. So, uh, this is called, in the case of the algebraic case, this is called the projective algebraic case. called the Enrique's Zariski classification. Okay? And there's a theorem, which was <laughs> proved later, uh, uh, which by Kodaira, I think it may be with somebody else, but maybe with Spencer together, I can't remember right now, that A of X, if, if the transcendence degree of the full function field is bounded by 2, is 2, then that's the same thing as x is projective algebra. I'm talking always about surfaces. So if you have maximal many uh, meromorphic functions, then it is projective algebra. You're sort of willing to believe that. Interestingly enough, Hiranaka, and there is a rather simple example due to Hiranaka uh, some time ago, but I mean in modern mathematics, this is false in dimension three. So, of course, every projective threefold has three independent normal functions, but it is not enough to get projective algebra. Uh, okay, as you see, this is becoming a rather Japanese theory. Uh, what is the point? I'm speaking historically again. Kodaira, the classification I'm going to explain to you is called the Kodaira classification in the analytic case. So this classification that I will explain to you is called the Kodaira classification. in the analytic case. And he, his classification proves the projective classification and is using different tools. <clears throat> now, we in the United States were extremely lucky that the, one of the first American mathematicians in the area of algebraic geometry was a student of Zariski. And Mumford carried this Mumford, David Mumford carried this thing much further. And furthermore, when you read Mumford, you understand everything. It's beautiful. He, was, he wrote down the first good readable algebraic geometry book uh, ever. It's called Mumford's Red Book. And you can get its uh, paperback. It's, it's, it's excellent. I love it very much. So, uh, and Hartshorn's book is also very good, but I, I just like one of much better. And he proved many, many beautiful things. In particular, over all sorts of other fields. So you can imagine a riemann roch theorem is a counting theorem over other fields. <laughs> and it becomes uh, number theoretic and approaches solving problems such as Fermat problem and so on. Halting's proof of uh, the Mordell conjecture, which is something very close to the Fermat conjecture, uh, really is somehow re uh, reliant, reliant somewhat. You can think about it uh, uh, as 
that's using something like uh, some counting thing that you might think is Riemann Roth theorem or something like that. I'm sure it's not beyond that. But. So this has been carried much further, and as you will obviously see, I do not understand any of the arithmetic here. Okay, that's the history. Oh, Kodaira, uh, this was, I said, before, uh, between the wars, this was in 19, uh, the mid 90s. And the reason it was in the mid 1960s is that, and not earlier, is that he did not have the Riemann Roth theorem. So I will, I'm going to be able to tell you something about the Riemann Roth theorem. But he did not have the Riemann Roth theorem in the general, in the general setting. Let me just comment on that. So the Riemann Roth theorem um, which you need, the, the big piece of it that you need in this, in this thing, I can write down now in terms of letters, and I'm hoping Fane will be amused by it. <laughs> and then I will explain the letters. One of the goals of my sequence of three lectures on this subject is to explain these letters. So as I said, Kodara needed the Niriman off theorem, and he did not have it. Um, uh, but Zariski had it because it was proved by Nutter. So at least the big piece that is useful was proved by Max Nutter, the father of Emmy Nutter, and the co-author of a man named Lasker, who was a worldwide chess champion. You know, if you play chess, you know the name of Lasker. The neutral Asker theorem, you maybe know, of course, and, and he was a great chess, he was really a world master or something. So, Max Luther's theorem um, you can check me on this, I think it's uh, 1900 plus epsilon. Um, is that the, he computes the order characteristic, you've seen this for curves, for one dimension, that having the order characteristic for zero, for O, for this sheaf, is the, one of the key issues. Well, I won't, <laughs> so this is what I'm going, this is mysterious for things, so I'm going to get you excited. <laughs> it's C2. Now, you will be not happy to hear that C2 is the topological order character. Euler number of the surface. And so that, I'm not finished with the formula. <laughs> okay. The formula, by the way, for surfaces is, is, is understandable by normal human beings. The formula in higher dimensions is only understandable by non normal human beings because it, <laughs> it's, it gets complicated. Uh, this, this is very understandable. And here's the answer. Now, the first thing is, it doesn't matter. These, these are integers. For example, that's the Euler number. This is another one. I'm going to explain in detail what it is. Yeah. And by the way, and you will enjoy this. This is defined analy complex analytically, or uh, yeah, and you will be able to prove that it is a topological invariant. So this is, you see, this is, this is an analytic thing. This depends on the complex structure. This is topological, in fact, this whole thing is topological, it turns out. It's not so obvious. Because, right? Left hand side is certainly not topological. It's a big theorem that it's topological. So this this thing is C1 squared. And I will tell you what that is in the course of these talks. I'll tell you exactly what it is. It's some associated integers. These numbers are called churn numbers. And that's another very, very big piece of luck we had in the United States, is that Chern, who studied here in Hamburg as a student of Blaschke, many of you heard of Blaschke in complex analysis in one complex variable, but he was really a, a differential geometer, he's interested in differential geometry things, 
Chern is a differential geometer. He just died a few, a few years ago at a very high age, uh, in China, actually. And he it was here in Hamburg, and then he was back in China, and then there were very difficult times in China, and then Americans somehow were able to get him out of China. And he became a professor in Berkeley, in uh, California, um, and had huge influence on American mathematics, in particular defining differential geometric, a priori differential geometric invariants of certain ve vector bundles which play a role here. So, this is, I don't, this is so that's, those are the churn numbers, and the churn numbers, when you put them down like this, give you the quite a characteristic, and this is what you need for the projective classification. Number. And Kodari didn't have that, and so Kodari did something else in the analytic case. And in the analytic case in the early 1960s, Atiyah and Singer uh, proved their uh, index theorem, so they, which is very, very general. Their work implies remodelable. Generality. I should comment that this is the algebra. This is the algebraic case. just died this year and a few months ago. He is very fundamental for German mathematics because he really built up Max Planck Institutes around Germany and, and established relationships with the rest of the world uh, in, in research mathematics. Fantastic guy. So all, his home was always in Bonn, so I probably <laughs> I live in Bonn. But Max Planck Institute in, in Bonn is the center of center research institute in Germany for pure mathematics. In Leipzig, there is another Max Planck Institute, which is also good for uh, pure mathematics, but has a very strong applied flair. For example, recently going into biological mathematics and things of this type. But in Bonn, is still classical. The institute that Hitzelbuch uh, built up is still classic uh, pure mathematics. So these are the great names. This is name dropping. And this huge history, which is incredibly good. So you need Riemann off the end of Okay. And that's all I want to say. So let me start giving you an example. So my go my first goal is uh, to give you typical examples. in each Kodara uh, class. Okay. So let's remember the classes are minus infinity.
Now, a ruled surface is a simple-minded thing. So a ruled surface, say, of genus G, it is a P1, a holomorphic P1 bundle over a curve of genus G. So any P1 bundle over a curve of genus G has, you can see, has Godard dimension minus, minus uh, infinity, and a lot of work in this area was fundamental work to set up the classification here was in the Italian school. Uh, I mentioned these names that who, who were involved with, for example, this name, the Castel Nuovo. So discussion of, of this matter really, I think, is based around the work of Castel Nuovo around the turn of the century. Um, so, you didn't miss much. I just, uh, one of my goals is, one of my main goals is to give examples in each of these classes that are very typical. And the first example is, is what are called ruled surface for the obvious reason, because it's just P1 vibrations to a curve. Okay, and uh, these are Kodara class minus infinity. You're not surprised because P1 doesn't have any homomorphic forms on it at all, so you could restrict and get some if you, if you had any other homomorphic forms. It's more or less the argument. Well, that's that's simple minded. If that's all there were, then uh, we wouldn't have any work to do. But there's much more. Even in K, in, in company full of infinity, there are many more interesting things. I do want to tell you about Hintzelbrook. And he's in, he, he's of your all mathematical age when he worked in, uh, proved some results here. So to give you this is an example of a great mathematician, uh, of course, many years ago, but nevertheless, uh, when he was just doing his diploma and his dissertation in Münster, uh, he was thinking in, a, uh, in this general region here, and he was curious uh, about the case. So here's a book. And of course, this is, pre is embedded in the old Italian literature uh, uh, of uh, Zegre. Here's what was interested in rational surface. skipped over in this classification that I, I, I didn't do it on purpose just because I'm, I'm uh, stupid. There's, a, there's a, a point here. Before I go further, I want to make a little detour. If you have x as a surface, you can blow it up. You can blow it up at a point and get a new surface. And you, what you can do is you can keep blowing at various points. So here's X. Then you blow it up and you get the thing that you blew up. And then you blow something up here. And then you blow something over there. And then you blow something here. Then you do the blow something there. Blow something there. Blow something there. You can just blow up points all the time. And of course, then if you allow that kind of stuff, there's not going to be a classification there. You're just going to keep on blowing up, right? It's just some wild blowing up. So this classification is under the assumption Minimum. And that means you can't blow anything down. <laughs> okay? You can't blow anything down to get a manifold. You might blow something down to get a singularity, but you can't blow anything down to get a manifold. 
So the rational surfaces uh, that Hirzebuch studied here in his very, very early days, and they're called Hirzebuch surfaces now, and very well understood, uh, are, are in this category. Hirzebuch surfaces fit in the Kodaro dimension minus, in exactly this category here. Uh, they are P1 bundles over P1. Yeah. And you see in those early days, in the geometric setting, these are over the reals S2 bundles over S2. And I think if you, if you look at, at the early literature just after the war, in particular the fiber bundle book, um, the first fiber bundle books, the, the classification theory of, of S2 bundles over S2 was not at all known. And it's not at all clear. So Hitzebuch, I'm sure, was interested in the holomorphic structures on S2 bundles over S2. And by the way, until recently, it wasn't at all clear what are the holomorphic structure bundles on, uh, on S2 cross S2. They could have been the could have been the Hitzebuch surface. So, could have been the Hitzebuch surface, could not have been, but there were some other possibilities. And used invariants invented by mathematical physicists to understand these possibilities. Okay. So, uh, we're already coming very close to some interesting questions here. But anyway, Hitzebuch classified and discussed these things are called Hitzebuch surfaces. They're written down, they're parameterized by an integer. I can tell you in great detail all about them. They're called sigma n by many people. And one reason they're called sigma is that that's an s. And the reason it's called s is because of Zegre. So this was Zegre understood these surfaces in the Italian in, 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 in Italy way long before, but not in a precise way. OK, so that's the point. And what is the point? Uh, these are exactly the minimal rational surface. And I haven't told you what I mean by rational surfaces. This means that the function field of these things is just the rational functions in two variables. Just like P1, the function field is the rational. So now we get to the classification. You start give the field Describe, describe the surface. So give the rational functions in two variables, describe the surface. These surfaces, if they're minimal, because blowing up doesn't change anything. You say you have to assume minimal, otherwise it's stupid. So you, you, you assume minimal, given, given a rational function field, it's a usable surface, whatever that means. So n is a parameter? Hmm? n is a parameter? Yeah. Let me just tell you what it means. If you have P1 as a base, you can look at all the line bundles over P1. Okay? Here's the line bundle over P1. And maybe I'm going to write the zero section here. Okay? And of course you have the infinity section. So if it's a line bundle, it's a copy of C as each fiber. And if you add, you, you're allowed to add infinity, you can add infinity to each point. And you get a new bundle, and this new bundle is a P1 bundle. So here's the book surfaces are all compactifications. So sigma n is compactification <laughs> of a bundle, a line bundle on P1, which is called the nth power of the hyperplane section bundle. And a and a, so I have to tell you what H is. This, this is a line bundle. So the nth power you know, that's t 10 n mol 10 tensor product. But what is H? This is the line bundle that corresponds to the sheaf of vanishing, uh, 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 well, sheaf of germs of meromorphic functions with exact and most one pole. That's sort of the generating line bundle uh, on, on P1. And these are the various powers of the generating line bundle, compactified to be called Hitzbuch surfaces.
And if it's a beautiful little paper, which is maybe even his dissertation, I don't even know. But three or four years, no, about three years later, he proved me my wrong thing. It's incredible. Okay. This guy is, was at that time extremist, he, well, he, he, extremely sharp guy who could fuse the huge uh, technology that was available in France along with his own, own ideas. And he was very, very lucky because his teacher sent him to Zurich uh, for an extended visit, like I want to send you to Monk, uh, an extended visit to Heinz Hopf. And Hopf really understood these things. Hopf, uh, you see you know, these bundle stuff and all of this topology around and so on. This, this is really the strong influence of Heinz Hopf. So that, that's that stuff. <clears throat> okay, so I just gave you two examples. Maybe I'll give you a third example, and then I'll quit. In Kodaira dimension minus infinity. My goal is in the two remaining lectures to give examples in. in uh, The next class of examples comes from uh, dynamics. And the dynamics uh, of the early part of the 20th century <clears throat> which fortunately Kodaira somehow knew about and then later on people such as Sternberg that's discussed in much greater detail. <clears throat> that is the problem. You guys who are interested in dynamics. So we take C2. So the, the next construction will be construction of hop surface, hop surfaces. surface is this. You have X, and as you all know, you, it's a compact surface, so you might be amused to think about what is its universal cover. It's not simply connected. These things are all simply connected here, so both the fundamental group of these, of these uh, where did they go? The fundamental group of these uh, rule surfaces, of course, comes from the base curve. So that's pretty simple-minded stuff. Let's start here with compact surfaces, unknown universal cover. That's pretty interesting. This is compact, this is perhaps highly non-compact. This is a jump in the situation. So one of the first things you want to do is look at something up here that might be amusing. While one of the first things you might look at, even I as a naive little boy even uh, thought about looking at this thing. You see, it's slightly non-trivial to topologically. It's a sphere, it's a three sphere, right? Topologically. But it's not trivial. It's not just some cell or something. Well, you are therefore interested in what are the possibilities for writing x as c2 minus 0 modulo a group. And let's say modulo a group z, which is generated by one generator. Let's say g z is generated by one by generator G, which maps C2 to C2. Well, here we have the universal cover, but of course, you have a fixed point at the origin. All right, so you can imagine you have some dynamical, some discrete holomorphic dynamical system on C2, C2 with a fixed point at the origin. And uh, of course, this is a very natural thing people, a lot of people have considered at that time. And then, and then, of course, you, you have, here's the origin, and here's, here's, uh, here's what's happening. You take some more of it, and it goes out here, g of z, and so on. And then you go backwards, 
and you contract down here to the origin. So you're interested in classification of the contraction mappings with fixed point at the origin. This was known in the year 1900-0 almost to a French mathematician with the name of something like Lettuce or something like this. Um, and one of them is this. One of them, uh, Hopf knew very well. He didn't know, uh, uh, so the Hopf, idea of Hopf was, <laughs> don't be so fancy here, let's consider a linear, a linear thing, a, a linear dynamic, a stupid dynamic system. So ZW goes to lambda 1 Z, lambda 2 W, with absolute value of these lambdas, um, less than one. So a contraction, a stupid dynamic system, just contraction. And you can see what happens here. It's very interesting. Here you have, uh, say, the sphere as S3, and it gets contracted down by this thing to a smaller S3, and so on and so on. So the fundamental region for this thing will be the region here, right? The fundamental region. So everything can be brought back to this fundamental region. Nothing is identified in this fundamental region. So really what we've got here is S3, S3, and then these points are identified, right, with the contraction. So you obviously see what the manifold is. X is S1 cross S3. Right, because the circle gets identified that way, and S3 around here. This is the hop vibration hmm? over S1? What? Is it the hop no. uh, vibration? No, I, I, I know what you're about to say, and, uh, I, and I, I will come to you uh, in maybe 20 seconds. Okay. Let, let's make sure you're on the same page as I am here, okay? Because it's not yet the hop vibration, but it's related. Okay? So, Hopf's idea is to take this contraction mapping. If you want to make it precise, take these things to be one half. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't matter. Okay? Yeah? Yeah? Okay? And now you have the unit sphere. Say this is the Hopf, these things are one half. You have the unit sphere, and it takes the unit sphere to the unit sphere uh, times a half. Then the next thing takes it to the unit sphere times a fourth. Then the next thing to the unit sphere times. You see? Or you go the inverse mapping, it takes the unit sphere to two times it. Okay? So the system brings everything back into this little fundamental region, which is the unit sphere here, and then the unit, and the unit sphere of one half here. Nothing is identified here inside. What happens here, of course, this is identified with that. So when this is identified, an interval you identify the two endpoints, you get S1, right? A circle. So this manifold, which is the quotient by this uh, silly little thing, is interesting. It's S1 times S3. And I remind, I note that the first Betty number is odd. And we had some big optimism that is something that, that comes up in complex geometry. The first Betty number should be even. Remember, it's 2G in the case of Riemann surface. Okay. So this is a non-trivial manifold, also this way. This surface, equipped with this, this way, is called Hopf surface. Okay. And now I'd like to answer Thane's question. You can map this surface, in this case, to P1 using, using the Hopf vibration. So the Hopf vibration, uh, the Hopf vibration maps S3 to S2, which is P1, just the S1 bundle over P1. So I kill the S1 in this thing, and I kill the fiber of the Hopf vibration in this thing, and I get P1. This thing's easily definable here, it's just some projection. So this is a torus bundle, a one-dimensional torus bundle over P1, defined by this silly little system. And <clears throat> this is an example in Kodaira dimension minus infinity. So here, the Kodaira dimension is minus infinity. Now this, this contraction mapping is a simple line of contraction mapping. 
But the theorem of lattice, which is uh, really proved by, and maybe refined, proved by Sternberg, I'm not sure, is a complete uh, classification of contraction mappings of C2 with fixed, of this situation. And up to isomorphism, they are polynomial and explicitly written down. Okay? So this is the linear kind. If you take a polynomial, a polynomial contraction, there's a list of them. If you're amused by it, we can talk about it. Uh, this yields x as the universal cover, c2 minus the origin, minus low z. But in this case, and the Kodaira dimension is minus infinity. But in this case, there aren't any neuromorphic functions. Now there will be curves. You will see that there's some stable sets of this dynamical system which get modded out into curves, tori, maybe two. So there, there, are, there are curves on this circuit. So let me just uh, complete my little lecture today by saying, okay, the power dimension minus infinity, uh, there are three things, rule, and inside of this Hintzimov, Uh, then what the heck do we uh, talk about? Uh, what else do we talk about? Uh, Hoth. And using the classification of contraction methods. These are definitely not algebraic. And then question mark. This is still very much open. So what other interesting non-algebraic surfaces you will find in here. These are the algebraic surfaces. It's open. This is very much related in modern mathematics. There are many things here. There's many Japanese names I can say here, and some, some interesting French people. The work seems to be associated to foliation and deep understanding of homomorphic vector models. The problem is, it is possible to have surfaces with essentially nothing on them. No curves, no, dif no differential forms. He's going to say, where do you start? You have to have some place to start. If in this theory you have some place to start, then you're going to get a result. This is the theory of Nakajima. This is the theory of various other Japanese, uh, and, and more recently some French people, by the way, in Marseille in this group I talked to you about this morning. Um, there's some very beautiful results as soon as you have a little bit. And it seems that it's related to some delicate things called maybe singular foliations and understanding all possible vector bundles with certain parameters. Um, you might be amused by this guy because we were talking at the table about the computers today and so on. This guy has some beautiful results. When he was a student, oh, he came from Romania. Uh, uh, he got his doctor's degree in Zurich, and at that time he saved his money as much as he could, and had a little money, and decided he should invest it. This is a long time ago. Guess what he invested it in? A P P L E. <laughs> and this blew up. This is now blown up into really some unbelievable sum of money that, that this, this graduate student in Zurich. This is also a very outstanding method. Okay. So that's open and still very interesting uh, here. These things have nothing on them, no meromorphic functions, no curve, nothing. Um, but it started really with Heinz Huff. And amazingly, I'm probably, if you're ever interested, because I know some people do John Anderson's place, I think that guy, the French person's name, is still like this. Have you seen this name? I mean, how much dynamics is this? Mm -hmm. I mean, is it with A or with uh, there is someone who thinks about that same map? Yeah, maybe this is with, with A. A. With A, yeah. And there is someone else French. Yeah. 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 It was an obscure paper. I think nobody knew yeah. about it. And uh, 
But it, it, it means a classification theory. It's a classification of, of, of these contractions. So effectively, it's a classification of observers. And I think uh, Hopkins didn't know about this. And Codriner uh, uh, learned about this. And then he put this in his classification theory. Yeah. So I'm not sure what was really proved by whom, but it's, it's interesting. So is there something um, like a, so if you look at the Python fundamental group of these uh, surfaces, right. I mean, is there some kind of obstruction? Because I mean, for four manifolds, you can always make the fundamental group to do whatever you want. I mean, a real four manifold. So, yeah. I mean. So there's certain, there's certain obstructions to right. getting a complex structure on some four manifold. Okay, so, okay. So can you see? But, but, but again. Even if you assume so, the, uh, if you assume the fundamental group is Z in this case, it doesn't help you. Uh, well, you, you come to this, you come to this situation here, you don't understand, right? right. And what I'm saying is, like you know, you can not hope to classify all the real four manifolds because the fundamental group can be anything you want. That's right. In some sense, groups cannot be classified. So, yes. I mean, is there? I mean, so so what I'm saying is. Um, so there is no such thing here. There is no reason that you cannot classify these things because no. you know, the fundamental no. can be very. But there is a reason for higher dimensions. So somehow it goes up in, in the complex. So, okay. For six, somehow for I don't know why, but I, I think for here definitely there's no problem with the fundamental group. Okay. I mean the, the theorems around here that help enormously. For example, uh, if you know something about the first Betty number here, then with analytic methods and so on, you 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 can. Get out of this classification. I mean, it, it, right? So really, you come very, very fast to S one playing a role someplace. <laughs> yeah. But it's really a problem with. Uh, I, I think it's a problem with Donaldson. But on the other hand, all of this Donaldson theory and all plays a, a very big role here, and it's getting close to what you're talking about because it's four manifold theory. And I, I just don't know enough about it, I must say. But it's, 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 it's very, as German says, actuel, and uh, uh, very interesting people working on it. Okay. Okay, so I'll try to give you examples of everything next week. No, no, no not next week, tomorrow. <laughs>